According to ancient philosophy, fate rules our affairs with no discernible order. What lies ahead is impossible to predict. Throughout history, people have sought to protect themselves from any danger the future may hold. But disaster still often strikes when we least expect it. Rearing its head suddenly on a holiday weekend or falling out of the clear blue sky. August 1972. A festive summer unfolds in Montreal, Quebec. Canada's second largest metropolis has been riding high in recent years, ever since a World's Fair helped transform the city into a popular destination. Montreal in the summertime is just, just gorgeous. People are in the cafes, people are walking downtown Montreal. It was a fabulous city at that time. Uh, Francophones enjoyed themselves, uh, were uninhibited, were usually, uh, uh, you know, very much more open than, than Anglophones were. There was still a spark from Expo at that time. Everybody was very excited about it. Montreal became, you know, a city people wanted to come to and love to live in. Along with its metropolitan atmosphere, the city boasts a legendary nightlife. The bars have never had the restrictions that they did in the rest of the country. Particularly the young people coming from other provinces. It was a big revelation to them to come to Montreal because the bars could stay open till midnight and beyond midnight. New restaurants and nightclubs pop up across the city, while many existing ones renovate to meet the rising demand. One establishment enjoying the boom in business is the popular Bluebird Cafe. The Bluebird Cafe was in the west end of the city, right downtown. And I can remember it as a kid growing up. Uh, Montreal was a cafe city, cocktail bar city. I can remember the Bluebird Cafe because I can, I can see it now. I see the neon lights. I can see the, the Bluebird on the neon lights. Originally a service station, the Bluebird is home to two distinct clubs, a cocktail lounge on the main floor, and upstairs, a western bar called the Wagon Wheel. This was one of the few places in the city, I think, at that time, which country music was featured. And country music was beginning to grab a hold in the urban areas. The Wagon Wheel caters to a younger crowd, most of whom are caught up in the current fad of Western music. Country music all the time. And uh, they all like country music. There was wagon wheels there, and there was uh, just country stuff, you know, that they have hanging on the wall and that. It was, it was good. We used to go there all the time. Friday, September 1st. Perfect weather and a holiday-long weekend conspire to create an air of excitement across Montreal. Hotels are full and streets teem with locals and tourists alike. Schools started and universities started after Labor Day, so it was the last of the summer celebrations. The young people were coming in. Uh, some of them had come home, some of them had come to Montreal to visit. They were having their last fling before they went back to school. As the day progresses, staff at the wagon wheel check their stock and prepare for a record night. With a popular band booked for the weekend, they will be filled to capacity. In tandem with the Bluebird's success in recent years, changes have been made to the layout of the building, some for the sake of ambience, others for security. In the wagon wheel on the second floor, daylight has been banished, and with it, a possible escape route from the building. All along one wall, it looks like there's windows. But in actual fact, those windows were boarded up, but there were curtains over, over the wood. A new door sits halfway down a back stairwell, a passageway used as a service entrance and potential fire escape. On this particular Friday, for the sake of crowd control that evening, it is locked from the outside. The explanation was the management locked that because uh, children who were underage were coming in and uh, they wanted to stop that. I suspect also the reverse was happening. There were young people there who were having a couple of drinks and they just disappeared down the stairs without paying. 
Only two open passageways now connect the wagon wheel to the street below. The main entrance, where patrons line up and enter, and a fold-away metal fire escape at the side of the building, accessible through the crowded kitchen. 5 p.m. One young woman planning for a night out at the Bluebird is 19-year-old Kathy McGimsey. Kathy recently started her first full-time job as a store clerk, a position that has given her a new sense of independence. She was the youngest of my five daughters. She was the kind of a girl, she would, uh, did volunteer work at the hospital, she babysat for people, and she's just all around, just, just an ordinary nice girl. She was a very pretty youngster. When she got to her own job, she just bloomed like, she was so lovely. She uh, got all dressed and she looked great. She just looked lovely. She had her dreams and aspirations. Sometimes she said, as uh, long as I grow up to be just an ordinary nice woman. <laughs> Years earlier, Kathy lost one of her sisters in an accident, a tragedy that left her mother more protective. Talk of the Bluebird Cafe has made Mrs. McGimsey nervous. A few weeks earlier, she enlisted her older daughter, Janice, to help ease her fears. I said to Janice, when you go up and see what this club is all about, and she came home and she said, you have no fear, it's just country western music and the kids. The thought comforts her as her youngest daughter, Kathy, heads off to the Wagon Wheel Bar. Never thought anything would happen to her, never. Never, never, never. In another part of Montreal, local resident Daryl Perrin is relaxing at home with his wife, Margaret, when his own plans for the evening take a fateful turn. My brother called me and says, look, I got a friend, he's just over from England. We want to go out somewhere where it's a lot of fun. He says, can you take us to the uh, wagon wheel? I said, sure, we'll go to the wagon wheel. So, and I said to my wife, are you gonna to come to the wagon wheel? She said, no, I, I really don't feel like going because I don't feel good tonight. And to this day, I'm very glad she didn't go because she'd be dead for sure. Daryl heads to the wagon wheel with his brother Grant and his brother's new British friend, Frank Rothwell. Frank had never been there before. He's only been in Canada two weeks. We were upstairs in the wagon wheel. We had only just arrived. The atmosphere was great. People dancing to the group and lots of pretty girls. A few tables away, Kathy McGimsey has met up with two of her friends. The three catch up on the week's events, mingle with new acquaintances. Around the same time, regular patron David Montgomery also arrives. Originally from the Gaspé region of Quebec, David has come to love Montreal's nightlife since moving to the city six years earlier. I remember the layout of the wagon wheel like uh, I remember my own home. The uh, doorman would greet you and, you know, he'd take you to your favorite table. David chats with his brother, Edward, who is also in town. Their younger sister, Elizabeth, enjoys herself with one of her own friends. You know, we each sort of had our own lives and went our own ways, but uh, we kept in very uh, close contact. She was studying and working. She was sharing accommodations with uh, girlfriends. We enjoyed going out to the local uh, dance halls and bars, it was just like uh, any young person. 10 p.m. The bar is packed. One couple is spending a rare evening away from their four children to celebrate a birthday. Nearby, a 19-year-old bride-to-be is having a night out with a friend before her wedding the following day. Her fiancé is due to show up later. Up on stage, Pete and the country gentlemen lead the charge into the long weekend. Everybody knew them and they knew everybody. It was just a fantastic evening. Everybody was having a great time. All that, however, will change in an instant. Upset patrons have returned after an earlier disagreement with the Bluebird's doorman. They are carrying a canister of gasoline. 
one of the club's exits is already barricaded by a locked door. Another is about to be sealed off by fire. September 1st, 1972. The wagon wheel bar in Montreal is filled to capacity. A young crowd more than 200 strong celebrates the last weekend of summer. At the entrance to the bar, disgruntled patrons sneak into the stairwell determined to cause a disturbance. Perhaps only intending to do some property damage, their actions spark a disaster. One guy emptied the gas container in the stairway. The other guy waited at the bottom of the stairs. And when his buddy came downstairs, threw a match. In an instant, a wave of fire engulfs the stairwell. The fire blocks the main entrance. Still unaware of the fire, brothers Daryl and Grant Perrin share a table with British newcomer Frank Rothwell. Suddenly, there was a whoosh, and flames shot up the staircase near where we were sitting. The lead guitar player in the group must have noticed it because he suddenly stopped playing. I was looking at the stage, and I saw the flames and the smoke coming. I just got up, and I started to go right away. I said, this is it. I said, this is it. It was like a wave. The people closest to the door saw the fire, and they're reacting to the fire. And the people around them, behind them, beside them are reacting to their reaction. It was so fast. People don't believe how fast it is. And people started to panic instantly. I just kind of yelled, don't panic. Nobody listened, of course, and everybody went in their own particular direction. I just stood there dumbfounded. Then I realized what was happening. The place was filling with smoke. Now, think of gasoline, how fast it lights. Imagine all the fumes it makes. And it was lit, and this just traveled one end to the other. With the front entrance on fire, Daryl Perrin rushes towards the exit at the back stairwell. Others follow, including his brother and Frank Rothwell. But in the back stairwell, the locked door is a dead end. Daryl fights his way to the front of the group, joining two men attempting to break through the barrier. And I started kicking the door and kicking the door, and all the time people were coming down on our backs and jumping the rail, just jumping right into the stairwell. And the guy's yelling, you gotta hold them back. We can't break this, we can't break this. Because the crowd was just pinning us to the door, okay? I turned around and I just started shoving. I said, you, you gotta go back. And I shoved and I pushed people back. All the time I was kicking the door too, okay? I can remember somebody picking up a chair, and he threw a chair at the windows to break them, and the chair just bounced back at him. There were windows there, but they had been boarded up with plywood. As fire races across the ceiling of the bar, David Montgomery tries to find his brother Edward and sister Elizabeth. He follows a stream of people into the women's washroom. I said to myself, they must know where they're going. There must be an exit there of some sort. It was just very dangerous, and I had to get out of there. A small window provides a means of escape, but getting each person through takes precious time. There was a window there that opened onto Union Avenue, and people were going out the window, just waiting in line for each person to go out the window and get down from the second floor. While David waits his turn, his sister Elizabeth has joined others making their way to the fold-away fire escape. In the back, in order to get to the fire escape, you had to go through the kitchen. It was a very narrow passageway, so people were fighting to get through. It was like going through like a funnel. They're panicking, and people trip, and one fell on top of the other. This is dark, this is smoky, this is hot, and they're in panic. Some managed to get outside and onto the fire escape at the back of the building. But the fire escape collapses under their collective weight, injuring some below while trapping others above. On the other side of the building, Elizabeth's brother David is more fortunate. Went out the window, grabbed a hold of a bar supporting the neon sign outside. I had enough sense to look down to see where I was going to go. 
I saw the car there, and I just wiggled along the bar with my hands until I got in the center of the car and then just let my body drop on top of the car. When I arrived on the scene, people were falling from the skies. People cut their, their hands, their faces, their bodies because they were jumping through glass, it was one after another, jumping for their lives. Across downtown, firefighters and police learn of the blaze and rush towards the two-story lounge and bar. For those still inside, chances of survival grow slim. Kathy McGimsey and her girlfriend are among those who have taken sanctuary beneath tables or are trapped in corners of the bar. Also struggling for breath in the thick smoke is the bride-to-be and some of her wedding party. At the same time, dozens remain in the back stairwell where the fight to break down the door continues. It was horrible, like a nightmare. Young girls were screaming, God help us, we're going to die. I shall never forget the scream the young girls were trapped and seemed to know that they were going to die. They're nervous, they're breathing hard, they're absorbing all these toxic gases, and they knock out. Now, they're not, maybe not dead yet, but they're not moving. The lock holds, but inch by inch, the frame of the door gives way. When it finally collapses, only the few still standing spill out onto the street. As firefighters arrive, Daryl Perrin begins a desperate mission among the unconscious in the stairwell he just escaped. What stuck in my mind was my brother and Frank the whole time, so I went back. It was like a ladder going up the stairs of people, and they were just piled on top of each other. Now I'm looking for Frank and my brother. When I was pulling these people out, I would look at them for a split second, a millionth of a second, and it's not them. I just keep going back and coming out, going back and coming out. Daryl's British friend, Frank Rothwell, is among the dozens of people trapped in the stairwell. All he remembers is collapsing. Maybe I was overcome by the choking black fume, or maybe somebody hit me and trying to get past. I blacked out. Well, I didn't even know I pulled him out, but he figured I pulled him out because I pulled a lot of people off the stairs after. Not far off, David Montgomery has yet to see any sign of his own siblings. I was in shock. I was just dumbfounded. I was just frozen like a, a block of ice. People were saying, do you know where such and such a person is, you know? And I said, no, my brother and sister, I haven't seen them either. And uh, everybody was looking for, you know, their friends and relatives. And uh, it was just, uh, just crazy, just crazy. Along with hundreds of others, the fiance of the woman with the wedding plans arrives at the desperate scene. He finds his fiance's best friend, but his bride-to-be is nowhere in sight. Across town, Kathy McGimsey's mother is getting ready for bed when she learns of the disaster. I always play the radio before I go to bed. I still do. I put the radio on, and that's when I heard about this fire. I remember my son, John, coming, putting his arms around me. He said, don't worry, Mom, nothing will happen to Kathy. She's too smart. Well, they got dressed, and off we went, as if our very presence would save her. September 1st, 1972. In Montreal, firefighters battle a blaze in the Bluebird Cafe, while local hospitals are overwhelmed by the incoming wounded. By midnight, there is little chance of finding survivors inside. Rescue has given way to recovery. A lot of people were uh, just wandering around outside. People that, like myself, that had been lucky enough to escape were asking me and other people where their friends were, where their relatives were. Once they cooled down everything, that's when you saw everything that was reality. All the people that were there, all the people that were in the positions where they died, people were spread all over the floor, and you see there was clusters of people at certain places. They were literally handing a body from one fireman's arms to the next fireman's arms to the next fireman's arms. And they were bringing a body like that. The crowd is looking, hoping that it's not their brother, their father, their mother, their sister, or their friend. 
Fortunately, Daryl Perrin discovers his brother down the street, injured but alive. He tells him that their British friend, Frank Rothwell, is already on his way to hospital. Others are not so fortunate. After hours of searching and hoping, John McGimsey learns that his daughter, Kathy, did not survive. Mary McGimsey has returned home to await the news. Now the McGimseys must live with the loss of two daughters. I knew that I'd have the taste of the bitterest grief that mankind can have. But she was a gentle girl, a gentle, gentle girl. And I could hear her, not that night, later on, I could hear her cry out to me, help me, help me. I knew she must have been some frightened. What killed the people was the, the smoke and the hot gases. Uh, that, was, that was the worst thing. That, that caught them by surprise. By morning, the death toll from the Bluebird Cafe stands at 36, making it Montreal's worst fire disaster in decades. Among the dead, the couple out celebrating a birthday. They leave behind four children. The next day, I was at the, um, at the morgue, and I just stood in the hallway and I watched as people would go into the room, and I could tell when they came out just looking at their faces that they've just identified a body. I saw a young man go in. He had his composure as he walked through the door and then just collapsed against the wall. It was his girlfriend, his fiance, who died that night. Both of David Montgomery's siblings have survived the night of the fire. His sister Elizabeth, however, passes away in hospital later that weekend due to injuries she received during the struggle to get out and the collapse of the fire escape. I was uh, in shock. I just went through the motions. I can remember making the arrangements to have her uh, funeral, and it was extremely devastating for, for my mom and dad and, and for myself also, although at the time, which I only realized later, I was in, in such shock that I don't remember all the details. I just remember going through the motions. I lost my sister that evening and I lost too many, uh, too many other friends that evening. It's just a very, very sad, very, very sad scenario. For investigators, the cause of the blaze is obvious, and the young men who started it are held criminally responsible. But an inquest into the disaster probes the question of how a gallon of gasoline managed to kill so many so quickly, and if better safety measures could have saved more lives. Part of the answer lies in the circumstances at the source of the blaze. Once the door at street level was closed, the flames moved quickly towards the only source of oxygen. You got the main entrance, which is going up to the second floor. This is doused, okay? There's a fire going up and there's, the door is open. There's a draft going to the back of the place. That's your fire road, if you want. Scrutiny soon falls on the emergency exits. Although the Bluebird Cafe had been checked by fire inspectors, no one noted the renovation in the back stairwell, the boarded up windows, or the restrictive passageway to the kitchen fire escape. In addition, city regulations seem at odds as to the exact number of fire exits the Bluebird Cafe should have had. The inquest leads to a sweeping re-examination of fire safety measures across the city. They came down with recommendations. One of them was that communications should be closer between the fire authorities and the building permit authorities in Montreal, and that all the other cocktail bars in the city should be examined uh, in the area and in the city over the next little while. After the Bluebird fire, nobody in Montreal went to bars the same way that they went before. After the Bluebird fire, you went into a bar, you looked around. And you, you looked for the windows 
You look for the fire escapes. You look for the exits. Because you take it for granted that behind those red curtains is a window. Well, maybe not. Today, nothing more than a parking lot sits on the site of the Bluebird Cafe. No permanent memorial of granite or steel exists to recall the day when disaster struck on a holiday weekend. Only the scarred recollections of those who lived through it and the memories of those who died. You know, a lot of families were devastated and still are devastated by that fire, still affected by that fire. It was a terrible tragedy, and I think that uh, Montreal has felt very, very badly about it. I feel that Elizabeth should be remembered in uh, the hearts of her family. She was important to, to us, and uh, we will never forget her.